2. That this endeavouring to make progress in such knowledge ought not to be attended to as a thing by the by, but all Christians should make a business of it. They should look upon it as part of their daily business, and no small part of it neither. It should be attended to as a considerable part of the work of their high calling. The reason of both these may appear in the following things. First, our business should doubtless much consist in employing those faculties by which we are distinguished from the beasts about those things which are the main end of those faculties. The reason why we have faculties superior to those of the brutes given us is that we are indeed designed for a superior employment. That which the Creator intended should be our main employment is something above what he intended the beasts for, and therefore hath given us superior powers. Therefore, without doubt, it should be a considerable part of our business to improve those superior faculties. But the faculty by which we are chiefly distinguished from the brutes is the faculty of understanding. It follows, then, that we should make it our chief business to improve this faculty, and should by no means prosecute it as a business by the by. For us to make improvement of this faculty as a business by the by is in effect for us to make the faculty of understanding itself a by faculty, if I may so speak, a faculty of less importance than the others, whereas indeed it is the highest faculty we have. But we cannot make a business of the improvement of our intellectual faculty any otherwise than by making a business of improving ourselves in actual understanding and knowledge so that those who make not this very much their business, but, instead of improving their understanding to acquire knowledge, are chiefly devoted to their inferior powers, to provide wherewithal to please their senses and gratify their animal appetites, and so rather make their understanding a servant to their inferior powers than their inferior powers a servant to their understanding, not only behave themselves in a manner not becoming Christians, but also act as if they had forgotten that they are men, and that God hath set them above the brutes, by giving them understanding. God hath given to man some things in common with the brutes, as his outward senses, his bodily appetites, a capacity of bodily pleasure and pain, and other animal faculties. And some things he hath given him superior to the brutes, the chief of which is a faculty of understanding and reason. Now God never gave man those faculties whereby he is above the brutes to be subject to those which he hath in common with the brutes. This would be great confusion and equivalent to making man to be a servant to the beasts. On the contrary, he has given those inferior powers to be employed in subserviency to man's understanding and therefore it must be a great part of man's principal business to improve his understanding by acquiring knowledge. If so, then it will follow that it should be a main part of his business to improve his understanding in acquiring divine knowledge, or the knowledge of the things of divinity. For the knowledge of these things is the principal end of this faculty. God gave man the faculty of understanding, chiefly that he might understand divine things. The wiser heathens were sensible that the main business of man was the improvement and exercise of his understanding. But they were in the dark, as they knew not the object about which the understanding should chiefly be employed. That science which many of them thought should chiefly employ the understanding was philosophy, and accordingly they made it their chief business to study it. But we who enjoy the light of the gospel are more happy, we are not left, as to this particular, in the dark. God hath told us about what things we should chiefly employ our understandings, having given us a book full of divine instructions, holding forth many glorious objects about which all rational creatures should chiefly employ their understandings. These instructions are accommodated to persons of all capacities and conditions, and proper to be studied not only by men of learning, but by persons of every character, learned and unlearned, young and old, men and women. Therefore the acquisition of knowledge in these things should be a main business of all those who have the advantage of enjoying the Holy Scriptures. Second, the things of divinity are things of superlative excellency, and are worthy that all should make a business of endeavouring to grow in the knowledge of them. There are no things so worthy to be known as these things. They are as much above those things which are treated of in other sciences as heaven is above the earth. 
God himself, the eternal three in one, is the chief object of this science. In the next place, Jesus Christ as God-man and mediator, and the glorious work of redemption, the most glorious work that ever was wrought. Then the things of the heavenly world, the glorious and eternal inheritance purchased by Christ and promised in the gospel, the work of the Holy Spirit of God on the hearts of men, our duty to God and the way in which we ourselves may become like angels and like God himself in our measure, all these are objects of this science. Such things as these have been the main subject of the study of the holy patriarchs, prophets and apostles, and the most excellent men that ever were in the world, and are also the subject of the study of the angels in heaven. 1 Peter 1 verses 10, 11 and 12. These things are so excellent and worthy to be known that the knowledge of them will richly pay for all the pains and labour of an earnest seeking of it. If there were a great treasure of gold and pearls hid in the earth, but should accidentally be found and should be opened among us with such circumstances that all might have as much as they could gather of it, would not everyone think it worth his while to make a business of gathering it while it should last? But that treasure of divine knowledge which is contained in the scriptures and is provided for everyone to gather to himself as much of it as he can is a far more rich treasure than any one of gold and pearls. How busy are all sorts of men all over the world in getting riches! But this knowledge is a far better kind of riches than that after which they so diligently and laboriously pursue. 3. The things of divinity not only concern ministers, but are of infinite importance to all Christians. It is not with the doctrines of divinity as it is with the doctrines of philosophy and other sciences. These last are generally speculative points, which are of little concern in human life, and it very little alters the case as to our temporal or spiritual interests, whether we know them or not. Philosophers differ about them, some being of one opinion and others of another and while they are engaged in warm disputes about them, others may well leave them to dispute among themselves without troubling their heads much about them, it being of little concern to them whether the one or the other be in the right. But it is not thus in matters of divinity. The doctrines this nearly concern every one. They are about those things which relate to every man's eternal salvation and happiness. The common people cannot say, let us leave these matters to ministers and divines, let them dispute them out among themselves as they can, they concern not us. For they are of infinite importance to every man. Those doctrines of divinity which relate to the essence, attributes, and subsistences of God concern all, as it is of infinite importance to common people, as well as to ministers, to know what kind of being God is. For he is the being who hath made us all, in whom we live and move and have our being, who is the Lord of all, the being to whom we are all accountable is the last end of our being and the only fountain of our happiness.